Thank you very much. Uh, nice to see everybody. It's my turn for the magic microphone now. <laughs> um, I'm, um, I started off my career actually at the Scottish Colleges, so I'm familiar with the soil types at um, Crichton and know what a challenge they are. Um, I then joined ADAS as a dairy advisor before my husband dragged me out to California, which was um, a very useful eye-opener and made me think out of the box, which has led me to a lot of the work I do now. Um, I worked for a, an independent agricultural company when I came back to the UK in 1994 and um, maize had come in in um, a very big way in the south of England and I was based in Dorset and we saw a lot of improvement in dairy cow yields um, but along with that a lot of uh, um, problems with um, fertility um, and other health issues with livestock and that led me to get very frustrated really working with vets as to why we weren't able to raise our management to the level of the problems and iron out what we were improving on one hand, we were losing on the other. Um, and I happened to come across um, an Australian lady who was um, helping on a farm where we had basic milk fever problems. And she said something which has just changed my life from then on. Um, the penny dropped. And she said, you're spending all your time looking at the silage clamps and all your time looking at the grass. And the problem with the UK is that your soils are too good and you never look further down the pipeline, so to speak, and you need to look at your soils. And um, when I presented Enoughfield um, on this in 1998, um, the, I was the only paper discussing soils. In fact, they'd never had another paper on soils. And now, as we know, everybody's talking about soils. And um, it's great to see that the subjects become, it raises its level in profile. So um, moving on. Um, I'm looking at soils as their impact on forage cropping, but on livestock health. So my bottom line for my interest in soils is reducing vet bills. And it's astounding how much um, impact it has, not only on animal health, but ultimately on human health as well. Just so that you know that in the Somerset levels, they always make sure their animals have plenty of fresh water. And um, this is looking almost exactly 12 months ago, and I'm glad that we see some sunshine today because my heart was sinking, thinking that we might be facing three months of this again. These soils were under for at least th three months, some of them four, and um, I've had a very interesting time trying to recover them. Soil compaction in its extreme. <coughs> so um, I think we've had a very good um, introduction today to thinking in circles the whole time. And um, I'm doing this constantly. So whenever you're thinking about soil, you're then thinking about the forages, you're then thinking about the animal, you're then thinking about the slurry, and then you're back to the soil again. And the whole um, agricultural movement is constantly in circles. And whatever you do today, you know, you'll reap the benefit hopefully tomorrow. Um, I'm a great believer in looking at the um, resources you've got. The greatest natural resource for any farm is its soil. Um, there are things that you can influence. Obviously, the rainfall is not one of them. Um, I'm looking at some potato work at the moment with irrigation, but largely in the UK, we're obviously not irrigating and we have to manage the rainfall that we have. Um, the fertilisers, I'm not necessarily talking you know, conventional ammonium nitrate here. I'm talking organic-based fertilisers. There are some very useful products out there that can help you um, with dot control as well, and I'll come on to that later. Um, the type of livestock that you're running, how they're going to influence your farming methods and what you expect out of them. The dairy industry, I expect many of you have observed, is polarising as time goes on. And there are some sectors that are making more and more of their forages and soils and fertilisers. And certainly on many organic farms now, I can see um, forage production outproducing conventional or sort of nitrogen focused grassland management. So um, there is huge potential for very healthy, nutrient-dense forage on an organic system. And I suppose in my heart, really, I would be a biological farmer. Um, I will work with conventional farms to a biological system on organic farms to get the best out of um, the soil. And if you can use certain products to help you do that, providing they're causing benefit rather than damage, there's a lot of potential to really um, get a strong economic um, vision there. We'll come round to the, um, the, the plants and the foodstuffs, but obviously I'm aware of the time, so we'll just move on. I'm looking at soils for the physical soil type. So we've heard a lot today about compaction, digging holes and looking and seeing what you've actually got beneath your feet. And going back to that initial picture of the water covering the land, um, I find it now a bit like um, speaking to somebody who's keeping their sunglasses on, that sort of frustration that you can't see what's be below the surface. So if you're going into a field, 
just get one of those small little border spades that you can chuck in the back of the Land Rover or carry under your arm and just dig a hole, just a quick small hole, as we heard earlier, just the depth and you know, the size of the spade, just to see what's going on beneath the surface. And in the way that you would look at silage, you know, you're always holding the silage, seeing if it's overheating, seeing how moist it is, seeing how you know, hot or cold it is, and smelling it. Do that same thing with the soil. So get the soil in your hand, feel it, evaluate it, and smell it. And it's a very cheap soil analysis test. And the more you do it, the more you get very nifty at um, evaluating it. The interesting thing that I find, which has not been touched on at all today, is the work that's going on in America and Australia, which is hugely <coughs> helpful in recovering our soil structures. And that's based on the chemistry of the soil. And some of you may have come across the cation exchange, um, soil evaluation, um, soil audits, depending... I think, is this spelled now? Is this working still? Oh, is it? Um, yes, it is. Has it got the green light on? Yes. Um, but looking at the calcium, magnesium, sodium, potassium balance in the soils and making those mineral elements work for you. And I'll come back to focus on that because it hasn't been covered so much today because I think it's a very useful aspect of what we need to be focusing on. And the other bit is the biological bit, earthworm evaluation, condition scoring earthworms, I call it. Um, and I think that's something that we can just add a bit to as well. So um, my <laughs> practical evaluation of a soil is um, to think of a bathroom sponge. So in that top sort of um, zone that you're talking, you know, top eight inches to a foot, depending on the soil type, you want a bathroom honeycomb sponge type structure that is basically 25% air, 25% water, um, so that it's got plenty of space for microbial activity, which can then allow all the nutrients, the organic reserve, and the, the um, mineral elements to actually work and create a nutrient cycle that's going in the soil. And whether you use a slit aerator or a sward lifter, as well as this chemical balance that I'll talk about, to achieve that, that is what you're looking for. And another thing to, that's important with this is to remember that when you squash a bathroom sponge, it has got the power to bounce back up again. And this chemistry that I will allude to is, if you think of um, those children's games of magnets, where you've got the correct amount of attraction and repulsion within the soil particles, that is what you're looking for um, in order to get the soils to be able to recover and bounce back from compaction. And it's not just a question of physically aerating or lifting the soil. You want to get this chemistry right so that the soil physically will open and um, pull itself apart or hold itself together. So, for example, in a very tight clay soil, you want to be adding calcium and opening type elements to keep that structure open. In a very light sandy soil, you want to be enhancing magnesium and organic matter to help knit that soil together and stop it blowing away. And there's an awful lot you can do to manipulate <coughs> the soil physical structure by playing with this sort of chemical um, magnetic game. So as we've already mentioned, you must dig and you must become obsessive about digging and you need to dig a hole in every field every month so that you see it through the whole year and you get very, very familiar with how the earthworm populations move, where the earthworms go at different times of stress and what they're doing and um, recognise how your soil is functioning. A lot of this is common sense and um, it's really just a, um, a question of getting into the habit of it. When I first started, I'm really a cow person, and I started looking at soils, and I thought, oh, soils are so boring, I must find somebody else who does soils. And then I started digging, and um, unlike, um, we were talking about photogra holiday photographs of soil compaction, my holiday photographs were earthworms, and my children are quite earthwormy now. So you look at your earthworms, and you think they all look the same, but they don't. And in Wales, they have actually very sort of almost um, luminous, bluey type earthworms. There are three basic species of Lumbricus terrestris type worms, but as we would call earthworms. But always notice, um, if you put them on your hand, they don't like the warmth of your hand and they start wriggling. And if they're very healthy and they have a high microbial food level, they'll be this deep red colour and very, very wriggly. And if you're waffling away, as I do, talking to a bunch of farmers, the worms get very angry and cross and start almost jumping off your hand. And I'm almost waiting for them to start biting because they're getting so fed up on some of my farms that earthworms are so healthy. But they can get um, very aggressively um, unimpressed by being lifted out of the soil. And then you come down to other earthworms that look very anemic and very flaccid and have no energy whatsoever. And if you imagine that you dose these worms with some slurry, you're going to have healthy earthworms that have got the energy to get away from the slurry 
and um, sickly earthworms who just die and um, have no energy at all. And what I've noticed over the years with digging for earthworms is that if you hit the earthworm population with um, an aggressive slurry application at a particular time, and then you look at the earthworms as months go on, you'll have a whole handful of earthworms that are the same size. And a very good indicator of a healthy sward is that if you dig, you know, maybe now it's getting a bit wet depending on the farm, but if you dig at the time when it's nice and moist and warm, you'll have a very good variety of earthworm sizes. So you'll have the ones as thick as your finger, right down to very small baby ones that are a centimetre long, just little pale white ones. And that is a very great complement to your soil management because it shows you that you've maintained the population right the way through the whole life cycle. And I'm very excited now because I've recently heard that I think there's going to be a test coming in from Australia where you can um, count earthworm cocoons or eggs in the soil. And that will be a very cheap evaluation of a healthy soil. And um, it would be great to see if that comes into the UK and we're working on it. So looking at soil pH, there's one very important thing for um, all soils is that they do not get short in calcium. Obviously, if you've got a low pH, that's a very clear indicator but always remember that the pH is not just carried by one element. It's not just a liming issue. And it's carried also by magnesium, potassium, and sodium. And just as a one instance here I've learned from the Australian work, docs really love soils that are high in potash and low in sodium. And quite often I've controlled docs on conventional and organic systems in a grazing situation with cattle, um, by applying salt, because many of our soils following all this rainfall are low in salt and high in potash with slurry applications, and docks just love that. But if you elevate the salt, you'll find that the livestock will eat the docks a lot more readily and um, uh, on that basis stop them from heading mm -hmm. up for seed and you can start controlling the dock population. The cation exchange capacity is a subject I won't go into depth with um, here today, but just bear in mind a bit like this um, magnetic game I was talking about earlier, the soil, soil colloid particle, whether that's a clay or a little piece of organic material, is negatively charged, and the cations are positively charged and attract to that. So you've got a, a definite bonding to make these um, soil particles. So the better you can get the balance of the soil in terms of the different elements playing this game, the more healthy you will maintain the soil crumb structure. It's really um, a sort of a molecular structure of the big soil aggregate crumb structure that you'd see in practice in the field. And what happens is that the roots are exchanging nutrients with the soil particles. So the root hair will give off hydrogen um, atoms in order to attract nutrient elements. And you have this um, symbiotic relationship between the roots and the soil. And so it's far healthier to work with your soil to feed your crop than it is to start trying to feed directly to the crop. This balance relates to animal health issues. So cation exchange balance, or DCAB, you may be familiar with, with dry cow management. You'll get trace up, lock up and deficiency. I'll touch on copper deficiency in a moment. Um, metabolic disorders, grass staggers, obviously magnesium deficiency, <laughs> milk fever, calcium issues, and fertility. And a lot of fertility issues are improved drastically on farms by balancing up their soils. Typical grass silages are very imbalanced for the elements that are required for dairy cattle. So just um, looking at a, uh, about 2,000 samples that have been analysed over the last couple of years, this is courtesy of um, Thompson and Joseph Laboratories, but you often will get high potash, high iron and high molybdenum. And similarly, you'll get low calcium and low salts. And um, you just need to be aware that balancing up these mineral elements can be a lot of prevention rather than cure with animal health problems. This is an old picture of copper deficiency because you don't hopefully see too much of it these days. But with the typical bleaching of this spectacled look that James Herriot um, um, mentioned in his books, and also very poor quality of um, fur inside the animal's ears. And this leads on to fertility problems, poor feed conversion, efficiency, and um, obviously um, other veterinary issues. Looking at these um, soil analyses, we're looking for a balance, everything being in the green zone. I'm sorry this is rather small for um, looking at, but just to get an idea of how soils can be imbalanced. 
um, and just trying to equilibrate these mineral elements in terms of what we apply, whether it's a lime application, salt applications, products like keyserite. There's a very good new um, product called um, polysulfate from Cleveland Potash, organically approved, um, which I think will be very useful, um, high quality um, product that will go through a fertiliser spinner to enhance potash levels and sodium um, and a little bit of magnesium as well, if that's what is needed. We've seen uh, people discussing slit aeration. I'm a great believer of slit aeration on grassland swords. I think in 90% of cases, it does a very good job providing you keep doing it. It's not a one-off job. It's something that needs doing when the weather conditions allow every autumn or spring. One farmer I had played a trick on me. I saw the very compacted clay soil. Um, he slit aerated once, and between two farm visits, probably slit aerated half a dozen times. And I was busy talking away and digging a hole, um, and I had to look up to look at the trees to see if I was in the same field. The slit aeration had just revolutionized the soil structure and opened it up and aerated it, allowed the nutrients to start cycling. And if you haven't tried it and you're on not too stony ground um, and you've got enough soil depth, um, I know it's very difficult on some of the chalk ground to slit aerate, but it's, a, it's well worthwhile um, and will enhance everything else that you're doing. So it's not something that necessarily will do it on its own, but it will um, definitely uh, add at least a 10%, 20% improvement to nitrogen release and all the other nutrient cycling that's going on. Um, I will skip through this very quickly because one of the very biggest improvements over the last couple of years is to do with slurry. I've touched on these elemental balances. I can touch on them again if anyone has any questions and the um, subsoiling we've touched on. This is um, soil improvement, reducing molybdenum toxicity in soils by balancing up the, um, the magnesium. Doing the same thing by using gypsum, calcium sulfate, and aeration to balance up high molybdenum, copper deficient, high magnesium soils um, on clay, clay ground. Releasing phosphates by making sure that you've got the correct sulfate levels and relating that to the organic content of the soil. Um, the more humus is in the soil, the greater the phosphate potential for release. And I've even seen one that somebody kindly brought this morning, a soil analysis, where there's a lifetime's worth of phosphate in that soil, sitting there completely locked up, just waiting to be released. And as we all know, phosphate's hugely expensive, very difficult to apply effectively in the organic situation. And there are huge potentials of juggling these mineral elements in the soil to release phosphate. So always have hope. Um, I hadn't realised, I don't know if any of you have come across these slurry treatments recently. There are various slurry treatments. You add a liquid or whatever to a slurry lagoon and um, it effectively is aerating the slurry because it's causing a, an aerobic bacterial activity that's causing a convection current. And there's been some research on these. They're still a bit in their element, but um, certainly the ones I'm working with are hugely beneficial. We've done some carbon work on these, and it's only just this last year it's twigged with me why we're getting enhanced levels of N, P, and K at the end of a treatment period with these slurry additives. And it's because the microbes are actually able to fix nitrogen from the atmosphere into the slurry. So not only are you ending up with a slurry that is no longer toxic to your earthworms and your soil, but it's also enhancing the biological fertilizer potential of the slurry. And if there's one thing I think that every farm should be looking at, it's treating these slurries. So in the same way that you would compost a solid manure, you should be bio-treating every slurry so that you are enhancing the nutrient value and not causing a toxin problem. So just focusing a bit on the final summary, um, do look at this mineral element balance within the soil to get the soil physical structure right, as well as the um, sit aeration and um, sward lifting and all the rest of it. Remember that everything good is an aerobic function. So you want aerobic soils, aerobic slurry, and everything to be in a respiratory aerobic function to get this soil nutrient efficiency up. And um, you can use complementary soil products to balance the calcium and balance the magnesium, balance the salt, so that you have everything running in equilibrium. And if the soil is running nicely, everything just moves forward so much more quickly. Environmental benefits of um, treating the slurry and um, this cost-effective cost um, mineral supplementation in livestock. 
Um, one thing you're probably all doing, but I think it's really important following the rainfall of the last um, sort of 18 months, this summer's obviously been a lot better, but um, do make sure that your animals have access to lump rock salt. There's a huge salt deficiency um, in dairy cattle at the moment, and they seem to be definitely needing it, and obviously it keeps their electrolyte balance correct. Different fertiliser products, I can answer any special questions you have on those. Um, but the main issue is to remember that the um, livestock fertility and disease resistance is very much related to the soils. And I'm doing a lot of work at the moment on TB disease resistance. And it does seem to me that where the soils are healthier, um, the enhanced disease resistance is very, very positive. And you can do a lot to boost the immunity of the animals from the ground up. I'll just shoot that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much.